I'd like to call this a meeting of the Lakewood City Council for Monday, August 20th to order. Madam Clerk, please call the roll. Council Member Barth. Aye. Council Member Bokey. Aye. Council Member Brandstetter. Here. Council Member Moss. Here. Deputy Mayor Whalen. Present. Mayor Anderson. Here. And Council Member Simpson has been excused. You have a quorum. Thank you. Would you all please rise with me in a moment of silence in honor of our men and women serving overseas, followed by the flag salute. Showcase. Okay. We now move to uh, proclamations and presentations. We are fe featuring uh, the VIP barber shop with Ms. Sun Williams, the owner. Please join Deputy Mayor Whalen at the podium. Hi, how are you? Good to see you. In most barber shops, I'm known as a cheap date because I don't have much to cut. But a VIP barber, when you walk through the door, you're more than a paying customer, you're family. Sun Williams opened her business 10 years ago in Lakewood. In that time, she relied on word of mouth to build her client base, and her reputation extends beyond the South Sound. Online reviews show customers willing to travel as far away as Kirkland for the $12 haircut. Williams sees each client, whether a doctor, plumber, or active duty military, as a chance to build a relationship and learn from each other. She recently re relocated her barbershop to a new location at 3615 Stillicum Boulevard. She's now spreading the word that VIP Barber is again open for business. It's because of William's dedication to treating each customer as a VIP and because of her longevity in the community that the Lakewood City Council recognizes VIP Barber as its August 2018 business showcase. And we are very proud of you and Proud to have you as a great business member in our community. And because of this, we create this wonderful opportunity to showcase your business and to give you a chance to say a few words. Congratulations. Thank you. And we'll get a quick picture here. You want to say a little bit of history about your business? I know that. Uh, Becky said all sorts of good things about you when she brought you in and all the wonderful things that you're doing. <laughs> yeah, Miss Newton, I have to it's up to you if you want to say a couple of things or just come get a haircut. Oh, I like to express a lot of things, but uh, English is my second language, so I'm going to make a brief as possible. Uh, uh, moving to a new location, I had to experience a lot of difficulties and uh, unusual uh, circumstance caused me a lot of anxiety and pressure, but uh, I got uh, great help from uh, workers of uh, city of Lakewood that, uh, that are neighbors and then uh, friends. They were really uh, surprised <laughs> with that uh, great help, uh, uh, give me uh, encourage and uh, strength to go on. So uh, using this opportunity, I just want to express uh, <laughs> that uh, uh, thank you very much. Well, thank you. Oh, would we'll you come down would you join it? Join yeah. us down in front for a picture here, please.
now move to uh, public comment. This is the section of the agenda when any member of the public may speak to any item of uh, interest to the city, whether or not it is on the agenda. Please limit your comments to three minutes. The yellow light comes on at a 30 second warning. The red light comes on when your time is up. Please identify yourself by name and place of residence, such as Paul Bolke, Lakewood, Washington. The first person who's signed up is Mr. Dennis Haugen. Dennis Haugen, Lakewood, Washington. Mostly comments I have is about the last meeting. Front page there, when I, my history of growing up in a small town is I got a good dose of history. <clears throat> and probably the tens of thousands of little small towns have these uh, every five year, 10 year uh, parades of which then thousands of people come back even though they aren't on the farm anymore, maybe two generations, and learn about how <clears throat> it was settled and the difficulties of uh, settling. The, the many decades of hardship to get, to get the uh, farm producing the way they do today. The other thing I noticed on here is uh, you're going to spend $25,000 on this uh, workshop. Probably need to spend it on a detoxification workshop. In 2006, look at your second page. 2006, I took pictures of the food they were feeding the kids in the, at Park uh, side and uh, then at Clover Park. I got many more photographs. Junk food everywhere. Then I went back in 2008 to Idlewild. Took, they did have a little fuss and they did make a little fuss and they tried to improve, I guess, but went back in in 2008 feeding cookies for breakfast, you know, at uh, Idlewild. So it, it told me that it's useless because number one, you as elected officials don't have any control. Read the last page, the NEA, take it from the attorney, said it's about power, not about education. You can't fire a teacher. They don't do the, if they don't produce to a certain level. You're useless as elected officials. Now I happened to go to one of those little country schools that tens of thousands of people went to. In those days, the teacher confronted the parents and the parents could get a teacher fired if they didn't produce. And out there, on, uh, there's a new gal now on the scene, Candace, uh, uh, Candace Snowden, black gal, sharp, has risen to the scene, and she's going to be addressing these issues far better than I can over the next few meetings. Thank you. The next person who's signed up, uh, I apologize, it's either Dan or Don. Reynoldson. Don? I am Don Reynoldson, and I have lived in Lakewood my entire life. My folks' um, um, homestead began in 1967. We live on Angle Lane. We're off of 100th Street Court, southwest and Angle Lane. And the speed limit on Angle Lane is too much. It's 25 miles an hour. Honestly, I don't think anybody goes that. Um, back when I was a kid, a little girl was hit off of her bicycle riding on Angle Lane. I don't remember what the outcome was. I was young. Um, but just the other day, a car was going the speed limit, and the car behind them swerved around them to get fast, to go faster. So they passed them. I have grandchildren that are in that yard every day, and I don't want to see a, an accident. So my question is, I don't, I'm not here to propose anything other than I pre, I, I'm not privy to speed bumps. That's not the, 
going to solve anything but piss a lot of people off. So I'd like to know what will be done about all the speeders on that road. I mean, it leads right into the park, you know, and it's a residential street. So I'm opening it up to you for some comment and ideas. Well, our public comment session is to listen. Uh, we, we don't have a, a give and take interrogatory, but okay. we are aware of the issue and staff's looking into it. Okay, that's all I have to say. Thank you. Next person who signed up is Chelsea Becker. All right, good evening. Thank you for your time. Um, my name is Chelsea Becker. I live in Tacoma, Washington. However, I was the store manager over here at the Target in the Lakewood Town Center. Um, I've provided a letter um, for your review at a later time, as I understand I only have three minutes. Um, on March 31st, somebody made an attempt on my life as I walked to my vehicle after work. After waiting for over an hour, a man got out of a truck and shot a gun at me. After reviewing target surveillance and the actions of the shooter, it appears to be a disgruntled employee shooting at me, the store manager at that location. On April 3rd, I met my, with my detective for the first time. He asked me for a list of any employee that was terminated or had a performance issue that they were counseled on. I provided him the list of which he asked, but highlighted employees that I felt were more, more likely to target me. I specifically told my detective there was a person on the list that I felt was a primary suspect and that my district manager and my HR manager felt the same to be true. I also asked on April 3rd if we could get the case to Crime Stoppers as I wanted this solved as quickly as possible so I could get back to work. My detective shared they could not go to Crime Stoppers until all suspects were interviewed, but they would do it once they were complete on their end. Over the next two months after that April 3rd meeting, I had a few discussions over the phone with my detective. Please, re please reference the letter I provided for details around two interviews that were completed. I feel there were some red flags raised that were never revisited, one of which the detective shared with me was a red flag. On June 6th, I emailed my detective and asked how interviews were going and the status of going to Crime Stoppers, as I had still not returned to work. He responded and said that because my list seemed to be endless, he wasn't done, but should be done within the week. I felt it was inconsiderate of him to refer to my list in this way, as he had specifically asked me for all the terminations and performance issues. Because of the length of the list, I had shared with him who I felt was more cause for concern than others. It made me feel as though my detective is dealing with time constraints, as he had previously shared with me he is working 130 cases. After that contact on June 6th and him telling me he would be done within the week and it could go to Crime Stoppers, I never heard anything. So on June 27th, I sent an email to the police chief, Sergeant Rich Hall, and my detective outlining my concerns with the urgency, concerns in the interview details, and impact this has had on my life as a victim, given some of the statements that were made to me. Not a single person responded to my email. This made me feel as if I do not matter as a citizen working in Lakewood, and that because I wasn't actually hit by the bullet, my case doesn't matter. This has had a huge impact on my life and my personal safety. This person at large is also a danger to society, and Lakewood PD has not exhausted all avenues to try and get any answers. As I never heard back from LPD, on July 18th, I reached out to Brianna Shoemaker. She followed up with LPD at that time, and on August 2nd, I still had not heard anything. So I contacted Brianna again, and she told me she had reached out to Sergeant Rich Hall, and he would follow up. Fast forward to today, I haven't heard from LPD, and we are approaching five months after the crime. And to my knowledge, I'm unsure if all interviews are done. So essentially, I have a call to action. One, it's to get us to Crime Stoppers to generate tips. Two, more compassion for victims. Three, urgency and follow-up in interviews and the concerns that arise in interviews. I appreciate everybody's time. Thank you. That's all the people who have signed up. If uh, anyone wishes to make public comment, they aren't foreclosed by lack of signing up. Please step up to the podium now. Is there anyone else who wishes to make public comment? Is there anyone else who wishes to make public comment? Hearing none, declare public comment closed. Now move to the consent agenda, Madam Clerk. A, approval of the minutes of the City Council special meeting of July 30th, 2018. B, approval of the minutes of the City Council study session of August 6, 2018. C, motion number 2018-40, appointing 2018 to 2019 youth council members. D, motion number 2018-41, appointing Mar Michael Arnett to serve on the Public Safety Advisory Committee through August 6, 2021. 
E, motion number 2018-42, authorizing the execution of a contract with Beecher's Foundation in the amount of 25,000 to provide a variety of nutrition workshops for the Lakewood community. F, motion number 2018-43, amending financial policies. G, items filed in the office of the city clerk. One, public safety advisory committee meeting minutes of June 6, 2018. Two, planning commission meeting minutes of July 18, 2018. And three, planning commission meeting minutes of August 1, 2018. Thank you. Is there any item on the consent agenda which any member wants removed from the consent agenda? Hearing none, I'd entertain a motion. Been moved by Mr. Wayland, seconded by Ms. Moss, that we adopt the consent agenda. Is, is there any further discussion? All in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, nay. Motion carries. We now move to the regular agenda. The first item is public hearings and appeals. This is the date set for a public hearing on vacating a portion of unopened right of way adjacent to 7703 59th Ave West. Do we have a sign-up sheet for testimony? It should be there. It's under here? Yep, in yellow. Thank you. Mr. Busich. Good evening, Mayor, Deputy Mayor Wallen, members of the City Council. Flood Creek LLC has submitted a request to vacate a portion of the alley right-of-way adjacent to the property owned at 7703 59th Avenue West. The unopened alleyway, as you can see in the graphic as presented to the public as well as on your screen, um, bounded by 77th Street West on one end, 59th Avenue West and Burgess Street. It um, currently is unopened. As you can see from the graphic, it, we're looking at approximately a 20 foot by 100 foot uh, dimension for the alleyway requested for the vacation. Flett Creek LLC proposes to incorporate this approximately 2,000 square foot section of right of way into their property. They plan to redevelop their property into a 10 unit apartment complex and the property was previously listed as or used as a hair salon. The applicant in accordance with our code has submitted an appraisal that values the proposed land at $18,000 or about $9 a square foot. We reviewed, reviewed their methodology and the results of the appraisal, and we concur with it. On July 2nd, the City Council passed resolution number 2018-08, setting tonight for a public hearing regarding the proposed vacation. Notice of the public hearing was published in the Tacoma News Tribune. A placard was posted on the site. Mailers were sent to property owners within 300 feet of the proposed vacation area, along with contact with all the local utility companies. To date, staff have not received any objections to the proposed vacation, and the recommended conditions of the vacation are listed in the staff report, which is in your packet. Staff are recommending that we proceed with the public hearing tonight, take comments from the public, and barring any controversy or any counterproposal to the vacation, that um, we be directed to prepare ordinance for city council consideration on the next council meeting, which is September 4th, actually will proceed with and vacate the property. With that, I'm prepared to help answer any questions you may have. Any questions for Mr. Busich? Mr. Whalen. Mr. Busich, is it unusual where you've got a partial vacation like this that other neighbors don't call up and say, gee, me too, or is it this fairly common? This is kind of a funky one. I think it's, it depends on if others have also been using the right of way. Mm -hmm. Let me advance to the next picture if I can. This one also, if I look down below, go back just a sec if you would. Yes. It looks like uh, to the south, there are two buildings that seem to be encroaching into the right of way. Surprisingly enough, yes, there are. And this is not an uncommon occurrence in an unopened right of way where the adjoining neighbors start to take advantage of it and use the public property for their own purposes. Go ahead and go to the next one. If All right, the next slide is just a very simple, there. this is a, <laughs> going back. Uh, was ownership of the shed that's in the, un, uh, the right of way determined? We have not investigated who owns the shed, but I'm pretty confident it would be in the property immediately as I'm looking at the screen to the left, I believe that's 
7711 and 7713. Someone in that vicinity owns it. Um, the question is, on an unimproved right of way, do we spend the time and the effort to go in there and require someone to remove a building like this if it's, if it's not harming anything, or do we require them to come in for a street vacation? One of the issues that we're undertaking right now is an investigation into unopened right-of-ways, alleyways, and partial streets that are, that are rem remnants, like Klein Street, that has been a problem for us. We're trying to amass a listing of that to figure out what do we do with this, and then <coughs> intend on bringing a plan to the city council here in the next few months that may involve leaving it as is, talking to the property owner to see if they want to pursue a vacation, or in some cases, just vacating it through council action and getting it off the books. Do we know when this was platted? It's in the, in the records here. It has been quite some time. Okay. So if I recall from a prior life, there's a magic date, and if it was a plat, Plat that occurred before a certain date and the county never improved it, that it doesn't need to be vacated quite, the title just needs to be quieted. I forget what that magic date is, but it's like 100 years ago. So what if it's sitting this year? Yeah, but. I'm sorry, I, I actually well, couldn't hear you. There's a magic date in, in, in say it's it's more than more than 100 years ago where if something was platted before that date and the county never improved the right of way that vacation isn't proper it's because the title has vested in the adjoining property owners by default what i forget things, what that magic date is but I, I just i'm not familiar check. with that um, all I know is that the one that gives most jurisdictions the problem is the Ballinger Act. That was from quite some time ago, and I'd rather not get into the details of that because I'm a little fuzzy on it. It's about 15, 20 years since I, I've dealt with that. I know it's a real thorny issue and a problem. I will tell you is that prior to moving forward to council, we do investigation to find out whether how the land came to be right of way, because if it was a dedication to the jurisdiction for a right of way, that basically resulted in basically being an easement when we no longer needed the right of way. It goes back to the adjoining property owner who, or owners who gave it to us for the use of a right of way. In some cases, it's really hard. In fact, we have one of those situations right now we're trying to ascertain who actually owns it. Do we own it or do the underlying property owners own it? In this particular case, because of the platting process it went through, it was dedicated as a alleyway to the jurisdiction of that kind of Pierce County. So you've answered my question. Okay, thank, thank you. you. Just a quick one. Is it the property 7703 that's the applicant? 7703 is the property that is requesting the vacation. Yep, got it. That makes sense then. I was thinking if it was the property to the right, they might want obviously a little bit more. Okay. It, just as a side note, if you look at this, you'll notice on the different ensuing blocks around it mm -hmm. that the alleyways in some cases have been totally vacated. There's nothing left if you look to the upper part of the picture. If you look to the right and to the left, the vacations that occurred in the past have left this slim remnant that really has little to no value to us whatsoever. And the problem with those particular tracks like that is people use them for dumping sometimes, and then they call us because it's on public property, so we have to go out there and clean it up. And um, of late, when requests have been coming in for like a half a street vacation where it dead ends on I-5, the answer has been no, we're not gonna give another half a street and deal with the Klein Street we'll work with all the property owners we're going to vacate it and vacate it in mass right. and just get it off of our records we don't have to deal with it anymore that's a little bit of a side side note well not pertinent to this particular vacation but i wanted you to know that <clears throat> any further questions from the council well thank you so now's the uh, opportunity to uh, take public testimony regarding the vacation of a portion of unopened right-of-way adjacent to 7703 59th Avenue West. Uh, the rules for uh, this testimony is similar to the rules for the public comment in that you are limited to three minutes per person. 
Uh, yellow light coming on at 30 seconds is a warning red light when the time is up. Uh, however, in this case, the subject matter is limited to the subject of the vacation. Uh, we don't have anyone who signed up, who signed up who's indicated they wish to testify. But that does not preclude you from testifying. Is there anyone present who wishes to testify concerning the vacation of a portion of unopened right of way adjacent to 7703 59th Avenue West? If there's anyone who wishes to testify, please step forward now. Seeing none, I declare the public hearing closed. We now move to resolutions. Resolution number 2018-10, Madam Clerk. Thank you and good evening, Mr. Mayor, members of the council. Uh, what you have in front of you is an item that was discussed at last week's study session, which would be a resolution ratifying several proposed amendments to the countywide planning policies. These have been reviewed previously through the Growth Management Coordinating Committee and the Pierce County Regional Council, and also approved and recommended for ratification by the Pierce County Council to all of the jurisdictions in Pierce County. The resolution deals with two topics, one of which is uh, referred to as dry sewers. And in the past, there has been a policy in place through the countywide planning policies requiring jurisdictions to put in sewers prior to their actual use so they may run to a, pro a project that is handled currently through septic systems. And then the other topic is related to what's been termed UGA banking or urban growth area banking. And that is an opportunity if the change in policy goes through through ratification to allow jurisdictions who wish to reduce their urban growth boundary for whatever reason to put that into a quote bank for other jurisdictions within Pierce County who are looking to perhaps expand theirs and that would be something that would be worked through the PCRC negotiation process. So um, you spoke about this amongst yourselves last week at the study session. If you have any questions, I'm here to answer them for you. Any questions for Ms. Speer? Mr. Branstetter. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, Ms. Speer, on the urban growth area banking, um, I guess my question is, what's the currency? Is it acres? You submit a certain number of acres and you get some acres back. Is it assessed valuation? When, you, when they go through this process, if someone gives up 30 acres of swamp, what does that mean that someone else can acquire? And that answer has not been developed yet because this is directing the PCRC to develop the criteria. Um, historically speaking, though, the way development rights have been used through the transfer of development rights program is depending on the type of land and what kind of yield you can get out of it for development, it has different value. So for instance, an area with a lot of environmental constraints would have a lower number of density credits that could be traded around, and perhaps this program will happen the same way. Uh, but that's not been set yet. It's PCRC is going to do that. Okay. And then on the dry sewers issue, in your comments you mentioned municipalities putting in sewers. But did that, is that, in the past, has this actually applied to developers who are like, developing subdivisions, but that weren't within an area where a sewer line reached them, that they had to put in a, a dry sewer. And if they did, did so today, they would have to do that. Yeah, for, I, I should have been clearer in my explanation. What has happened in the past is rather than, for instance, the Pierce County Sewer Utility to proactively plan for and extend sewer lines out toward areas that have yet to be developed, or taking them to areas that are developed within a city or within the unincorporated area, um, the developer, as they propose a project, are being asked to do this extension of sewer lines. And then once a, a septic system, for instance, uh, then becomes within 300 or 1,000 feet, depending on different situations of that new sewer main, they may be required to connect. But what has happened more often than not is these sewer lines get put in place and they're not accessed for such a long time that there becomes a problem of capacity and or integrity of the line, there's a lot of 
time goes by and it begins to break down or um, have infiltration through root systems, so they become useless. And so the discussion has been about updating this and allowing jurisdictions to change the policy to allow for options besides doing the dry sewer line as currently required. So if this became a Pierce County planning policy, then are there city of Lakewood policies that would have to be or could be adjusted? This, 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 this doesn't mandatorily direct a city to change its policies, but it gives the city the option? Correct. So do we, would we anticipate doing that given that we have some parcels in the eastern parts of Woodbrook and, and some things there of where if somebody went in and decided to build some things that sewer lines don't reach yet? Uh, or have staff thought about how we would take advantage of this policy change or is it kind of mute with us? I think it's mute. I think, um, in essence, the city is more interested in, in pursuing a position that the sewer utility proactively build these lines and take areas within the city of Lake that are currently um, handled through septic systems and mandate connection. But doing that on the backs of the sewer utility directly rather than having the city having to either take funds and then turn around and, and build the system, it's talking directly to the utility to build the system instead. So this is a slightly different twist on the, on the issue of sewers. I don't think Lakewood at this point has talked yet about this, either internally or at the elected level. How, um, <clears throat> when dry sewer lines were put in, and, and I'll just say saying they were put in by, and, and, and were turned over to the, uh, were, they, were they typically turned over to the sewer utility? Yes. Or, so for instance, in, uh, Partridge Glen, which is an area that might, it's in our UGA, but might or might not ever be annexed to us. But there are a lot of dry sewer lines under those streets when that was developed. Uh, that, uh, is there anything in this policy that will cause the Pierce County sewer utility to inventory its dry sewer lines and develop some sort of a plan to make them functional? This policy, no, but at the moment, they are in the middle of developing an update to their unified sewer plan, and I know Lakewood's going to be engaged as a stakeholder when they get going on that this fall, and that will be the opportunity to provide input and, and engage and um, advocate for, if you will, a more active sewer utility taking um, some more preemptive strikes, if you will, at this issue, rather than just sitting back and letting private development try to handle it. So if there is a dry sewer line um, and near, in front of your property and your septic system fails, you're not under an obligation to actually hook up to a dry sewer line. That gets into Department of Health issues, and I couldn't give you a very clear answer. Um, very vague answer for you this evening, sir, would be the idea is, yes, as a, if you have a failing septic system, either for an individual property or for um, a neighborhood or a mobile home park or whatever it is, once there becomes a health safety issue, mandatory hookup is, is kind of the next step. Whether it's to a dry sewer line or whether you pull a, a new line to it is another question. The first, the first question to answer is, taking a look at the dry sewer, is it even usable, depending on when it was installed? That, those sorts of questions would have to be answered first. And those would be primarily answered by the health department and the sewer utility? I believe so, yes. Thank you. So maybe we have a definitional issue here. I thought that the dry sewer lines were things like in Partridge Glen that aren't hooked up to anything. Dry sewer lines are at some point hooked into the main system, but when they are extended out, they may or may not be hooked up to anything right away. At the, they, at some point in theory, could be hooked into the active sewer system. They're there in the ground. The development at the far end may or may not be using them. You may have a long, stretch where 
the main goes to a specific development, it hooks into sewer, but all along here, there may be stubs out that are dry sewers to a presumed future development, and so they, they may or may not ever have been used. Well, yeah, uh, our current regulations applied to that would mean that people within a certain number of feet would be required to hook up. Yeah, yeah, there, there are rules about that, and then there's the, this question of the dry sewer. You have to install it regardless of whether there's anybody within a certain distance. So to Mr. Branstetter's question, if somebody's adjacent to a dry sewer line that's theoretically functional and their yeah. septic fails, they'd have, to hook, they'd have to hook up by our regulation, yeah. not just by... Yeah. County. Yeah, as, assuming the dry sewer is, is working or, or so it would have to get repaired or what have you. Yeah. Mr. Bolke. Thank you, Mayor. Um, I do want to address the other the other issue here, the UGA banking, which I I express my trepidation about. Um, but I but without going into all that, I would I would note that at the PCRC meeting last Thursday night, the county executive, Mr. Dan Meyer, mentioned that he was, the, I think they were, the county is okay with this, but his concern on this was that it would go in the bank but never come out, that as soon as someone shrank the UGA, because Pierce County in, in general has too large of a UGA, that, 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 that's the general belief, I guess, at the PSRC level, that if something went into the bank, it would never be allowed out, that as soon as someone said, well, we'd like to expand our UGA, the PSRC will just be like, no way, no how. So he was talking that it would almost have to be a simultaneous transaction, that nothing could go in until we knew it was gonna come out. Otherwise, we would just, over time, just be shrinking our UGA. So I want I want the members to, to know that that, because that isn't addressed in this, right? We're just asking the PCRC to, to come up with a policy on UGA banking. Yes, and, and apologies if this gets a little too wonky for, for the response here, Mr. Bogey, but you have the contiguous urban growth area, which is the big one in the middle of the county, and there are unincorporated areas, and then there's UGAs associated with specific cities within that. So Puyallup, for instance, has an urban growth area, and it's adjacent to but separate from now because it's ID'd as a Puyallup urban growth area from the county's urban growth area, right? Mm -hmm. So you could have... Puyallup reducing its UGA without Pierce County's big one getting reduced. Okay. And then you would have city and city trading off. I'm assuming that there would be a great deal of reluctance, not only by PSRC, but by cities within the county to do things that would change the size any bigger to the county's UGA. I'm assuming this process is going to move forward to be a city to city transaction. Where there's a, a an agreement between two parties yes. to, to do that. Yeah, I... I, I that's probably the only way it's probably going to work. Yep. Do you think okay. it's going to be infrequent? Don't you think it's going to be infrequent? I'm sorry? Do you think it's going to be an infrequent occasion? I think it will be infrequent, yes. Yeah. Well, I'm, I mean, I don't know that how many cities, having sat at the P PCRC, I kind of get the feeling that the whole thing is being done for the benefit of Buckley on one side and two or three other cities, Gig Harbor, uh, who's fighting growth, you know, really, really, I mean, to the point they have a moratorium. Um, they want to get rid of a large area. Buckley wants commercial. And I think at one meeting I was at, Edgewood and Milton were like, take some of ours too because we don't want growth either. So, you know, I think it's smaller cities that either don't want growth or want what they perceive as commercial growth. And so I think Buckley may be entering into this with the idea that we can have commercial growth, but nobody's going to ask us to take more people if we take more UGA. And I don't know that that's maybe not a naive assumption, but the Buckley does pretty well in front of the PCRC, so. Anything further? Mr. Brasser. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I guess I just really wanted to ask Mr. Bokey and the Deputy Mayor, um, their opinions about whether is this policy sufficiently developed to be able to come to any sort of predictable outcome in the PCRC to the point that we should support it or should we not support it 
so that some of the, you know, a greater level of detail is is, is clear as to what would happen. I get, based on the, Mr. Polky's comments, I'd be concerned that if <clears throat> some city gave up property that was a part of the growth, the population growth equation, and another city acquired property that wasn't going to be a part of the growth equation, but the total amount of growth that the county had to have with that, would other cities not involved, such as Lakewood, then be apportioned a bit more growth? So here's perhaps my uneducated take on this. I don't think this does anything one way or the other for Lakewood. That's my humble opinion. Uh, these come up and as a result of the rules of PCRC, they have to go out and either be approved or disapproved by the member jurisdictions. And if it doesn't, you know, if no one acts on it, then I think it dies after a certain number of days following the county's passage, right? Actually, the way the process works now is if a jurisdiction does not take any action, it's deemed to approved. have approved it. That's right, yeah. yeah. So if we don't take action, it's deemed to be approved. If we take action and we don't approve it, then that impacts the number right. of jurisdictions that get a requisite vote. So my thought is, since it doesn't impact us as negatively, and likely wouldn't, uh, and I don't know if it would impact us positively, this is one of those things where I don't see the downside to us supporting it, because there are going to be opportunities where Lakewood wants something and sometimes it's, you know, go along to get along a bit. And so there will be issues where, for example, we want the military centers push uh, pretty hard for JBLM that we may need a couple of these little jurisdictions to sign on with us. So it's a little give and take. I don't think it hurts us. I, I think we should have gotten those things that the deputy mayor is saying in this. I, 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 I actually think that the because the, of the turnover at the small cities, yeah. or in any city. Um, well, first of all, I don't know that Buckley sees this as a quid pro quo at any point in time. And, um, or Gig Harbor for that matter. Um, and we should have probably gotten those things in this rather than, um, and, and, and I think that there are I guess my concern is the unintended consequences. You know, what happens? What do we not know that can occur in this swap system? So. This, Ms. Moss. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I'm just thinking for the future. I, this is totally out of my league, so I'll admit that up front. But. If there's something that we can do now to prevent something happening in the future, should we do something with our policy at this point? And I'm thinking in terms of the uh, high-speed rail, how it, something failed years ago that wasn't paid attention to that could have been prevented us from being in the condition that we are in t today. So I'm just thinking out loud can we do something now to prevent further down the road? Yeah, I, I, I agree with one of the earlier comments that I don't know what the impact of this directly on Lakewood would be. Uh, I mean, um, I can see the jurisdictions mentioned having a particular interest that we wouldn't be involved in any of their transactions. Uh, I can't see any small city wanting to take on additional UGA to build homes because they already don't have the tax base to provide city services. And the economies of scale are upside down when you start providing residential services without any commercial. Um, so I think we, this is kind of, I rarely say this, this is a go along to get along. <laughs> Is there a motion? So moved. It's been moved by Mr. Whalen, seconded by Ms. Barth, that we adopt 
resolution number 2018-10. Is there any further discussion? All in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, nay. Motion, nay. one nay. Motion carries. Um, we now move to resolution number 2018-11. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Once again, Tiffany Spear, Planning Manager, Special Projects. And this is also something that was discussed at last, last week's study session. This is a more of a proactive action by the City of Lakewood to take three potential work plan items for the 2019 PCRC work plan to consideration uh, by the PCRC this fall. The first is to, again, talking about sewer, uh, I'll just read straight out of the memo, which is on page 59 of your packet this evening. Developing policy direction for consideration and action to update the Pierce County Sewer Utilities Capital Facility practices to construct sewer lines into existing incorporated areas currently served by septic systems. So this is an attempt to nudge, poke the sewer utility into operating more like a business. I believe this is something the council has had conversations about over time with the city manager. And so this was an opportunity to bring it forward now. So when the general assembly for PCRC occurs next February, hopefully it would be included in the work plan for next year. The second policy on the following page, develop policy direction for Pierce County and its cities and towns for inclusion in the countywide planning policies, comprehensive plans and other appropriate documents that provides a individual jurisdictions the ability to adjust population and employment targets based on situations or issues outside of their ability to govern. So this is simply trying to put a little bit of reality on that whole process of population and employment allocation, which occurs periodically. Office of Financial Management comes up with a county-wide number. It goes to uh, the Pierce County Council and the, all of the cities. Staff and elected level conversations occur. Ultimately, there is an allocation of both housing units and jobs to the various cities within Pierce County as well as the county itself, and then it's approved by Pierce County. What that doesn't do at this point is do things like recognize for the city of Lakewood, population goes up and down regardless just due to what happens on the base, for instance. Um, there's some environmental constraints in certain areas of the city of Lakewood where there's just never gonna be the densification that would be needed in order to reach some of these population projections. So Lakewood isn't unique in having these unique situations. And so the idea is that uh, have PCRC take this up and come up with some new policies that provide for a way for a city to explain why whatever number is assigned to them may or may not make sense over time. The third policy on page 60, consider the formation of a new metropolitan planning organization and regional transportation planning organization for Pierce County and its cities and towns. This is a follow-up to what City of Lakewood commissioned last year. Um, I believe it was Burke and Associates provided the Regional Planning Organization Options Report that was published last May. And um, this is just simply, again, an opportunity to take it back to the PCRC for further consideration and potential action. There were quite a few turnovers, politically speaking, in last fall's election. So a number of the members of PCRC have probably never seen the report that Lakewood commissioned or had part in any of the conversations last year about it when it went to them. So the idea is to reintroduce this idea, talk about it um, as a group next year and see if there's any um, impetus or a willingness to consider moving that idea forward. So the resolution would, would take all three of these things forward as something to request the PCRC to take up next year. Questions from Ms. Spear? Mr. Whalen. Uh, there you go. There you go. Okay. Now that we've got communication under control. Yes, sir. I, I have no problem with the first two policies. Um, but as a pragmatist, here's my question to you with regard to policy number three. I'll ask you a little question about predictive analytics. Okay. Snowball hell. <laughs> What's the chance that this would get past the city of Tacoma and or Pierce County? I would assume that the Pierce County snowball would happen and survive in hell faster than the Tacoma snowball. What Having said that, Tacoma? yeah, it, it doesn't happen without Tacoma. Right. There has been political change and staff change to some extent in the city, so I don't know if that would affect the conversation going forward into next year. Um, but at this point, city of Tacoma probably would not be supportive. That's what I would predict. Yeah, I have no problem pushing, you know, 
putting our stamp on these policy considerations, but I just want people to be realistic about, I'm really hesitant of investing too much of our city's staff time on this policy objective number three, because I think it's pushing a large ball uphill with limited return. Well, I, I join in that concern that we don't spend a lot of staff time developing a, a concrete plan because we also have the governor's office to deal with and this governor would not, mm -hmm. wouldn't approve it. However, uh, we have giving it lip service and advancing it, I think has a benefit in that those new people haven't seen Don Quixote charge the windmill. <laughs> Uh, and uh, keeping that alive has some benefit because I, I think there's a point where Pierce County is going to tip if the Puget Sound Regional Council doesn't change its ways and, and Kitsap may be in the same boat. So it, it's going to take a, a change at the governor's office and, uh, and some migration by Tacoma, I think it's going to be a natural evolution at the county level. And so uh, keeping the issue out there is helpful. Mr. Bolke. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I, the, the sewer one, what, and I, I'm supportive of it, but I, I kind of want to understand. So this is, this is a case in like Tillicum where we put in the trunk lines or we put in the major lines and now we got to get down all these other streets and down towards the lake. Is that what you'd anticipate under this policy if the county was to change that? We would somehow tell the sewer department and, and how would we make, maybe I'm asking too much, but how would we make this a priority for them? And I don't know that this would evolve into the ability of a city to say, okay, sewer so utility, this is what you do next. I think it's more of a conversation toward, again, that idea of the unified sewer plan being updated and maybe some executive level to that department's policies saying you will be more proactive in your planning. Um, it used to be, and I think to some extent this is still true for both sewer and roads in the county, it was simply, we as a county don't do this stuff. The private development side does, end of story. And so this is requesting that and in particular, cities like University Place as well as Lakewood, where there are areas that were formerly an incorporated county, still operate on septic, and now sewer lines have gone beyond those areas, but the, st the county utility never came through and filled in the gap. So trying to encourage, require, whatever it turns into, the sewer utility to come back and fill in those, those areas would be the first priority, I think. So Ms. Spear, in, in your... I think you've looked at this issue in past lives too. Um, in your experience in urban counties, or let's just say Western Washington, what do these sewer utilities usually do? Well, the- Is it the pay as you go system that Pierce County has or do most of them use a, we'll try to keep up with growth? It's probably more so the former. It's, it's private development doing this. The issue, though, that's separate and apart from whether the sewer utility is building itself out or the private development is hooking in and donating this stuff, is there is currently state law policy and Department of Health policy that equates septic systems to sewer. And so unless and until there's a failure, there's not going to be a requirement at this point from either the local or the state level Department of Health saying, we agree with this idea that everything should be sewered, period. There's going to be the argument both um, at the legislative political advocacy side from the private side, but also the, the agencies are going to say, these, these septic systems work. They've been shown to be effective, and they're lasting longer and longer, and we're not going to require, um, from our perspective, this hookup. And so there's going to be, even if this process were to be successful at PCRC, there's still going to be that larger discussion about whether the Departments of Health would agree and go along with this idea of forcing operating septic systems to hook into sewer. Thanks. So just as, as additional information, the county uh, sewer utility is currently including in its capital plan Ex sewer line expansions as a economic development tool. That is a change of 
policy that's mm -hmm. fairly drastic. Uh, the, the prioritization the, of what, uh, what and where would uh, those sewer extensions would uh, entail is still undeveloped. Uh, but the change to allocate some resources to actually building sewer lines, which the county hasn't done since about 1978 or something, uh, when it extended out here in Lakewood. Uh, I think there was one, one in Parkland a little later maybe, but uh, they really haven't built any. So uh, that's going to be a, a new priority. Uh, and uh, there might even be some innovative ways that uh, they can find a little more uh, cash flow to bond. Uh, so uh, I think this would be helpful as uh, encouragement uh, to uh, county council members. Mr. Brandstetter. Well, as, as I look at it, in, at, at the three policies, the, the one that is clearest to me uh, that, that, that makes good sense is, is number two um, because it's, uh, it's, it's, it's something that's needed and it's something that could benefit all the cities and towns um, in Pierce County, being able to go to that. And that seems an appropriate action for the Pierce County Regional Council to take. Um, I kind of agree with the deputy mayor on the last one that it's, um, you know, you know, this would, this would definitely not be something to hold your breath on to be able to, 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 to go and do that. I guess I don't mind saying that we're not going to spend any more of our staff time on this after we send it to them and we'll ask the Pierce County Regional Council to spend their staff time on it. <laughs> <laughs> to be able to go and do that. But until at least one of the big two <laughs> decides they want to uh, champion this through with the, with the rest of the county, um, in, you know, I, I don't know. So I'm, I'm kind of neutral as to whether it's in our resolution or not because I can temper the regulation. I am very concerned about the first policy recommendation. Um, <clears throat> Not that I wouldn't like the Pierce County utility to do this, but I don't like the precedent of going to the Pierce County Regional Council and having them tell, specifically target out one particular utility amongst a group of utilities to develop a county policy that that utility should operate differently. You know, there are more sewer utilities in Pierce County than just the one run operated by Pierce County. Tacoma has one, Sumner has one, Puyallup has one. Uh, I, I believe that there are a couple more. Uh, and, you know, this is not a good precedent to have. I mean, we would not want the Pierce County Regional Council to adopt a policy that says this is how you have to... Lakewood, your stormwater utility needs to operate differently than it is and single one out. I think this is an appropriate issue for us to, to communicate with Pierce County and the Pierce County Council to do that, but I wouldn't want to imply to the Pierce County Regional Council that they somehow have, can look at utilities individually. I mean, if they want to have a policy about all sewer utilities uh, that, that, that deal with things, that's the one thing. But I, I don't necessarily think that I'm comfortable with them being able to reach out and handpick individual utilities and say, we have a policy that applies to you. Um, and so, um, I, 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 to be honest, when, when we, when, when we, after we get a motion on this, I'm going to move to delete policy one from the resolution.
Yeah, I think it, it, it is a little different in that I think what it points out is that county governments were never meant to, uh, as developed prior to statehood, were never meant to provide municipal services to urbanized areas. That wasn't the way county governments were set up. So uh, they have a, a rather hodgepodge of utility responsibilities from inheriting failed small town water systems to uh, default sewer systems because there's no municipality to pick that utility up to. Uh, so that, that it interfaces with the Pierce County Regional Council in a different way than than the cities interface with the Pierce County Regional Council. Uh, and then, then, there, then there's the, the case of Lakewood. If I were off to offer an amendment to this, I would include the cities where Pierce County provides sewer utility because it's in the same situation as unincorporated Pierce County where we would like to see uh, the county further sewer uh, Woodbrook and University Place would like to see their dead zone between them and the city of Tacoma where uh, they need uh, they have some failing septic systems. Uh, sewer that doesn't really have the money to do it. So. Mr. Whalen. Here, real quick, how do you envision this playing out at the GMCC level? Or would it be that committee that would chew on this to help develop policy directive? More than likely what would happen is this, the intention as proposed in the resolution for you this evening is this gets forwarded for the informational purposes to the Pierce County Council. It gets sent to the clerk of the PCRC. PCRC takes it up to say yes or no to any of these policies. Do they want to proceed and include it in the work plan? Come next February, if they do so, yes, they would probably send all of them to the GMCC for discussion and recommendation back up to PCRC. So a year from now, it may come back with GC GMCC recommendations. Which, which could be up or down. Yeah. Any, fur any further questions? If not, I entertain a motion. We can still have further discussion. Is there a motion? Is there a second? It's been moved by Ms. Barr, seconded by Mr. Bolke, that we adopt resolution number 2018-11. Further discussion? Mr. Branstetter. Yes, Mr. Mayor, I would move to amend the section one of the resolution to delete the words sewer capacity, comma, connection and expansion, semicolon, and to uh, delete any portions of exhibit A that relate to sewer capacity, connection and expansion. Is there a second on the amendment? Is there a second on the amendment? Hearing none, the amendment dies. We now move to the motion. Is there further discussion on the motion? If not, will all in favor please signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed, nay. Nay. Motion carries. We now move to unfinished business. Is there any unfinished business to come before the council? There is no unfinished business. Is there any new business? Reports by the city manager, Ms. Krause. The first item I have for the city manager report is an update, which I'd like to call up CDBG and housing division manager, Jeff Gum, to provide that presentation. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, uh, Deputy Mayor, members of the council. It's my pleasure to be before you again to uh, present you another update. Uh, I believe the last time I was here was about March going through this, so 
I'll give you a little bit of an update since then. So the, the current status of the program is we're at uh, 14 projects completed this year. Uh, five of those were completed by the owner, nine were completed by the city. We have 14 projects that are either under an abatement order or a complaint. Um, six of those are at complaint and notice, which is kind of the starting process, and eight of those are at the abatement order, which is near the end of the process. Uh, of those uh, ones that we're working on, six are being repaired by the owner. So we're actually starting to get some decent compliance uh, from owner-occupied properties or owner-owned owner properties. Um, we've also got 10, oh, sorry, nine uh, monitoring and pending properties, actually 10, because there was another one that was added very recently. So I've, I've got a, a smaller workload of properties that's, that's ongoing, but there's still a few more coming through the pipeline. This map kind of shows you where the city has worked um, in the most recent year. So all of the blue dots are completed this year. There's a, a fairly strong cluster of them in the Tillicum and Woodbrook neighborhoods. Um, and then there's a few other sparsely kind of scattered here and there. Uh, monitoring and pending, they're kind of all over the city right now. Um, we have two nuisance abatements. I have been working on those for probably the better part of four or five months. Um, we've cleaned up two of those. I have one additional phase that we have to finish on one of those properties. And both of those are the pink dots on 108th Street. Um, and then all of the red dots are ones that we're getting close to um, working on demolition or actually getting the owners to complete. So the fund status where we are to date, we have a current fund balance. Um, there's two funds, the 105 and the 191. Between the two funds, there's about $390,000 um, in cash available for dangerous buildings. We have liens outstanding of about $260,000. Um, expenditures year to date, we're actually up a little bit this year compared to last year. We've got uh, $190,000 roughly in work that we've done and we've received about $90,000 back. So a little bit of outflow this year. Here's the schedule of outstanding abatement liens and the, the schedule that I anticipate getting repaid on those. Um, there's a, a number of, le of liens outstanding, 396,000 combined. This year, uh, looking at it's about another $61,000 coming in, so 150 or so is what I anticipate this year to receive in revenue for the city. Um, next year, about 121,000, 103, and, and so forth, probably from that, that point on. There's a fairly consistent schedule of abatements that we've had over the last three years, so it's looking to be 100 to $130,000 kind of on an annual basis coming back. Here's what we have completed since uh, March. I didn't include any of the earlier ones. Uh, this is a 15005 Grant Avenue property owned by Metropolitan Development Council. It, it had burned uh, with squatters in the property. Metropolitan Development Council actually moved, devol demolished this themselves. Uh, took a little bit of time. They had to put the funds in place, but they did demolish that. Uh, another dangerous property, 8209 Maple Street. Uh, common theme here, squatters. This property burned on three separate occasions. Uh, took a little bit of time. The, the bank wanted to I don't know if they wanted to lengthen this process or what, but they unfortunately lengthened the process. We had to uh, finally have the bank out there and they realized when they saw their property that it really was a full loss. And it, this, this building doesn't quite, the picture doesn't quite do it justice. The entire structure inside, um, first floor, second floor, were pretty much charred. So it really wasn't worth the uh, value of the building. Uh, another property, unfortunately those aren't the greatest pictures, uh, 9616 Gravelly Lake Drive. It's a commercial property. Um, it's, it's completed from an exterior perspective. So the owner came in and, and fixed the columns that were failing, fixed the roof that was failing, um, a lot of the soffit material, some electrical issues, egress issues from the exterior of the building. Uh, a, lot of, a lot of work was put into it. Um, he has yet to address, and we have yet to address with him, the interior components. So this has a, a second phase that's yet to follow. Uh, 15302 Union Avenue, I'm um, sure that some of you have seen this property in your passings in the uh, Tillicum neighborhood. This was a two-story commercial building, uh, had all kinds of issues with this building. It's, it was vacant, uh, I believe, 
for about seven or eight years, somewhere in that ballpark, maybe even more than that. Uh, had degraded, had fallen into a state of disrepair. The owner really didn't have any plans to redo this, um, at least anything that was feasible. So ultimately we ended up tearing this building down and this was actually the, the last building that I have torn down, the most recent building I've torn down, I should put it that way. So uh, the neighbors in the neighborhood, I, I got more calls from the, the coffee house behind that and the neighbors kind of across the road, they were ecstatic that this thing came down. So positive feedback on this one. Uh, another property, there's two of them that we've worked on in the Wood, Woodbrook neighborhood, 7305, 146. This is kind of a, a elongated piece of property. It had a single family house, which you can see in this picture on the front, um, and it had four manufactured homes in the back. So we removed the single family house. This one again had squatters in it for a number of years, uh, had pretty much trashed the inside of the building. Um, the building itself was a $45,000 piece of property. By the time the repairs were done, it would have been two or three times that. So they, we tore that building down. Um, the back side of the property, the owner addressed, so you can kind of see in that picture, there was th there's three, picture, or three manufactured homes. There's one that you can't quite see in the back a little bit. But uh, the owner did come in and remove all of these units. Uh, took a little while to get compliance, but now it's a, a vacant site completely. Uh, the very next door property to that, 7209 146th, another one of the kind of eyesores that we've had in the Woodbrook neighborhood. There was three houses on this property, so there's two that you can see in that picture, um, and one you can kind of see in the left on that side. There was, again, each of these structures had multiple fires. I believe one of them had three fires. Um, the one on the left had three fires. The one on the right on that side slide had one fire. Um, and then the one on the left on this slide had two fires that pretty much destroyed all of those units. Uh, so those, again, were a, a very large problem for the police with squatters in and out of those. Um, nice to get rid of those properties. The owner of those properties actually worked with us to give us access to the property. Uh, we were able to do it faster than she was able to do it with the tasks that she has on her plate at this point in time for some other development projects. So uh, we will be getting reimbursed for those fairly soon. Active abatements, you know, where we are now. Uh, 10101 Hemlock, you can kind of see a, a before and in the, in the process of. This was a, a dangerous structure that had sat vacant for again a number of, of years. Again, there was squatters into this property, all kinds of legal improvements. Uh, that's kind of what it looks like now. It's an individual who's developing it into a rather nice single family house. Uh, one in the Tillicum neighborhood was a garage. This was uh, an accident, I believe. The individual crashed into two garages. This was the second of the two. This one was recently repaired. Has not finished with the permit process. There's some engineering and some bolting that has to be finalized, but once that's done, the, the structure will meet uh, building code and no longer be dangerous. Uh, property that's been on the list for a while. The owner is doing this project. I, I don't have a more recent picture of this. This was a, a single family house on the, on the side that's attached to a manufactured home. He did detach these structures. The single family house, um, he pretty much tore all of the issues off of that, reframed it, put new trusses on it. I was out there on Thursday and he's almost done with the single family house now. It's a, basically a one man show. It's the owner and he's rebuilding both of these himself. So he's got the single family house where it will probably pass final inspection within the next two weeks. Um, and then he's gonna jump on to the manufactured home and, and finish those issues as well. So we're working with him on this one. He's, he's eliminated the dangerous conditions on it. He just hasn't finished the project. So we're still watching to make sure he finishes his project. Uh, 3411 90th Street, this was a single family house. It was converted into multiple units. I believe there was five families living in there at one point in time. Uh, this has since had permits issued for it. It's being converted back to a single family house. Uh, another issue with this property is the, the lot next door, or at least the, the large lot, um, was converted or is being converted into a commercial use. So he's applying for a boundary line adjustment. He's going to have two different parcels. One of them will actually be a commercial yard rather than a single family use. And then this will be a single family use what you can't see in the picture are all of his construction supplies and 
storage of bricks and materials and lumber and garbage and debris. I mean, he's, it's, it's a contractor yard for all intents and purposes that was illegally converted. So he's in the process of correcting those issues. Uh, 911 New Grove, another house. Uh, this was actually owner occupied before we got to this point. Um, the owner passed away, had done zero repairs for a number of years. And the back of the house literally just about fell off of this building. So the, the new owner has gone in and, and done some preliminary work to kind of shore this up and has permits to fix it and is in the process of doing so. Um, Seattle Avenue 5118, this is another property that the owner is working to demolish. Um, he's, there was a, a single family, or there is a single family house uh, to the right of what you're looking at in the picture. There was a, a number of illegal structures, outbuildings and so forth. He removed all of those structures and is working in the process of getting this asbestos uh, survey, getting it set up for a demolition permit, and this will be gone this year as well. Uh, one that uh, we issued a permit for, I believe, last Wednesday or Thursday it was a single family house. This is in the uh, Woodbrook neighborhood at the end of 146th. Uh, it was involved in a fire, I believe, nine months ago, somewhere about a year ago. The owner um, didn't have the funds to demolish it at that point in time, um, so we have we moved for a demolition order. They have since come in for a demolition permit and are working to, to remove this. There's, but there's really only a, a concrete foundation and, and a little bit of debris left, so it's not like it's a, a very large project. They should be able to complete that relatively quickly. Um, and then there's a, a series of Lake Grove and 99th Street properties. I believe some of you are aware of this property. <laughs> Um, unfortunately, um, this property has probably been the biggest nuisance property in the city of Lakewood. This one, the one next to it, 5908 Lake Grove. Good news is legal has done the uh, notification process to the owners. They've been served. Uh, this one on Friday, legal is in court for a warrant hearing, and this one will be coming down very shortly thereafter. How shortly thereafter? Um, probably within three weeks, two to three weeks. I mean, it, it's gonna depend on a contractor's demolition schedule because I don't know how far they are out right now. But it's once we have the warrant in hand, we're ready to demolish it. I have, I've already done the, the bidding process, so it's just a matter of crossing our uh, T's and dotting our I's. Uh, the, the property next door, if any of you need a couch or any furniture, there's ample furniture out there. You could probably find a nice one to go in your uh, garage. <laughs> this one uh, as well, we're, we're working on the notification process and, and legals looking within, I believe, I don't know exactly the dates, within the next couple of weeks, this one will be moving to warrant process and we'll be following through with this one to tear it down as well. Um, another property that people continue to dump on have continued to cause all kinds of issues with squatters. <coughs> Mr. Whalen. Yeah. Oh, I have one of my couches there. Um, just focusing on these, Jeff, a little bit. And part of it, it would be great at some point maybe to re-educate us periodically with a primer on the legal steps and the timeline we have to go through on process. Because I probably don't have in my, my humble um, sanguine self an appreciation for the process that you guys have to go through. But this one has been hanging around for a hell of a long time. Why is it taking us so dang long to get this one done? I mean, I can remember a year ago, it was right. almost, didn't have the same couches, Ms. Walker. Deputy Perhaps Mayor. these go to the legal lounge up on the second floor. Right. Uh, Deputy Mayor Whalen and members of the council, one of the things that we have come to appreciate is that things were not coming to legal at the outset. We would attend the CSRT meeting and everyone would sit around the table and in your worst bureaucratic nightmare, we would talk about any number of things and not necessarily move forward at the very beginning and say this is the one. Or if this week this was the one, two weeks later a different one was the one. And so when you see in your paragraph in your packet about how legal and community development have come together to coordinate on this, um, it's never been as streamlined as it is now, and I think there's a new appreciation for why you don't wait until it's broken to come to legal. 
I understand the resistance of wanting to deal with the lawyers. The lawyers always make everything take longer. But when you wait to go to legal until it's truly, truly broken and people are really upset, then you start the legal process at that point instead of starting it at the very beginning when you first realize that you might need to go there. We've decided instead of doing it that way from this day forward, what we're doing is we're letting legal know at the outset. And if we have a bunch of paperwork ready to go that we don't need, nobody complains about that. Right. People complain when we have to get all that ready to go. And in some cases, the notification, we can't get people served. Because the kind of people that let properties get to this point are the kind of people that are hard to serve. Totally. That shouldn't come as a surprise. Fully served by publication if needed, right? Exactly. Yeah. And that's what we had to do with this one. And at the point when we were starting publication, as I said, it was already well broken. And so um, that will not be happening going forward. Well, on this one, yes, because we had a relationship with the lender who we were told is foreclosing, who likely had to have notices for the owner to send the foreclosure notices, which right. we would follow up for possible service. What was the communication link with the foreclosing lender? I think both Jeff and I can. Yeah. I, I know that there were a lot of conversations. I had a call with Dimitri Beasy. <laughs> Me too. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and you know he wants these down as much as anyone, even though he is a foreclosing lender, still doesn't have title. So, you know, one wonders if you got consent and waiver from the foreclosing lender, how we much risk all, do you have with the owner? We would need owners? all property owners and interests. So, um, but how much risk is there, really? If you went down and mowed it down, <laughs> I mean, we, do, we have more risk being on Metro SWAT than we would tearing down a piece of crap that's worth 10 bucks. I, I hear you. At, and at the same time, that owner, that lender, Dimitri, and I can't remember the last name. Vizi. Vizi. His yeah. father used to own he the town does, center. Yeah, he does, he does have um, a certain amount of authority now since Nation Star has been legislatively corrected. So if, you know, you want to get into the details here, Nation Star case said that people, mm -hmm. lenders foreclosing, couldn't enter the property until the property was fully foreclosed. Absolutely. So that, that had unintended consequences yeah. of a lot of zombie properties. So they fixed that, and now these property owners with partial ownership of the property can now go on to the property, secure it, otherwise maintain or preserve it. And I, I think he understands what he has to do. Unfortunately, it's a little like whack-a-mole for him mm -hmm. as well. Um, the minute he comes in and spends a lot of time securing or otherwise preserving the property, transients, squatters come in. Mm -hmm. it, uh, how, how many calls for service have we had there? Um, it's ridiculous. 130. 130. Yeah. I mean, and, and uh, you know, you can't always be there 24-7 acting as security agents for one property owner. Um, and that's, that's the reality. So, you know, um, but, but let, I think, let, let me, let me I, ask I'm you sorry. This, so. okay. I mean, do we not have some right duty slash obligation if we can't get anyone to respond to go in and clean up the trash at least? I mean, yes, we're entering quote unquote the property, but we're not impacting the structure. I, but we and leave I'll, this. And I'll, I, I mean, <laughs> you, you bear risks. There, there is no but we no have here, risks. but we you have bear to risks. Weigh and, them. and I'll tell you, there are three statutes on abatements. Yeah. Um, and it's, I mean, it's, it's boring. It's not interesting. But <laughs> there are three statutes, and they have different pr uh, process associated with each one. Um, I can tell you this, though under all of them, even under the, the, the lower form of just cleaning up trash under 748, you still need to get a warrant before you go on to somebody's property. That's, that's the Constitution. That's Fourth Amendment right. Can we so have a right for if, administrative warrants, though? OK. And, and we could get an, an emergency administrative warrant if we wanted to. We could get an emergency inspection warrant if we wanted to. We would have to show there is an emergency. We might be able to, but we're so close to getting an actual warrant to do the demolition here. I've, I've done the, the you've yeah. got to serve the people first, and then you've got to do it by publication. Again, I know it's not a fun answer here, but if it were your property and you had a Fourth Amendment right, you would want to make sure the process was followed. And in all three statutes, we have to give that notice 
before we enter the property. And you're right, Mr. Well, Dimitri, we've, mm -hmm. we've talked Beasy. enough. Beasy. I think I can all by his first name. Um, you know, he's frustrated too, but he couldn't get service. That's the reason his foreclosure, he told mm -hmm. us he'd be done with the foreclosure in June. That's why we waited also to file on this because he kept saying, I'm going to foreclose. My contractor can do it cheaper than you guys. Right. So to some degree, I mean, bring. the department gives people a little bit of yeah. uh, wiggle room, but this has been a problem for years. When it got to legal, it's been a problem for yeah. a couple of weeks. Well, again, um, going back to the yeah. I, the education piece, and I appreciate where you're coming from. I, I do, and we're not. No, I'm not I, griping so much at you. I'm griping with you. Okay. Because this has been a source <laughs> of huge frustration for me. I got because it. Because of my wife working next door, my friends own the business next door. They're, you know, it's a mess. It and is. And it a attracts mess. a bunch of idiots who go and take dumps on their front door and then wipe it on the door jam and the window frames. It's I just know. unacceptable. So, yes, but but yes. a primer on the education as, as to process, as you know it now, would be helpful. So we understand so, where you're okay, coming from. So, and, okay, and really briefly, because I, I, I can tell you, we, we spend a lot of time issuing infractions, right. saying clean up your property, clean up your property, clean up your property. Take an average kindergartner, they know to pick up after themselves. Why do we spend that much time issuing infractions to adults who ought to know, clean up your property. So, you know, you can give people a little bit of room, but years, think and not. The second step in the process is an administrative complaint and order. That's, that's the second major step. That's where Jeff, the building official, usually come in. We post it, we give notice, we say, we're fed up, man. This is, this is happening now. Come to a hearing, we'll discuss it. How many times do they come? So, so one time. Going, okay. Yeah, we. But uh, we can, one we can, last we can time. Go, we then we go, get to court. We, That's the third part. We can't can't go back. We can't go forward. So yeah. Yeah. when this happens again, is there some change we can make to or modification of the municipal code that uh, under whatever jurisdiction police powers we can think of to uh, expedite? an emergency administrative process on health and safety mm -hmm. to clean up things like this, which are a very obvious health and safety issue, yeah. so that we can say, this is terrible, we need an emergency order, we have a process, public works or contract or whatever, and go in and haul the crap off. Yeah. Mr. Mayor, there's no need for a code change. Our record to date on getting such an emergency order is one day if it comes to legal, and we've got the facts. We can absolutely do this. The so, problem is in the overall process. We need to stop giving chances. Mm -hmm. Well, the That's other thing is at. resources, and one of the things that some of us have talked about is we have a budget coming up. Yep. This is a an effective, popular program, and I think there's strong council sentiment that we want to spend more money if we can do more things. And Mr. Buer so. and I have discussed that exact issue. And one of the discussions we had, and again, going back to general bureaucracy, is all ships rise with the tide so everybody gets bodies. Legal does not need bodies for this. It is distinctly possible that community development or code enforcement needs bodies. We can keep up with it. It is not a matter of being overwhelmed by these or anything else. It is a matter of getting in sync with each other and not giving the opportunities. And I'll tell you what I think has happened. In the beginning, we caught low-hanging fruit. And we were able to persuade people to get properties cleaned up. And these guys really got a lot done on limited resources that didn't take us to that place. We're now at a different level because the low-hanging fruit is gone and we're actually running into, I'm sorry, but occasionally competent counsel on the other side. Mm -hmm. And that makes a big difference. And it is more important now than it has been in the past that we get it all right. Legal does not need the resources. I do think code enforcement, building inspection, those sorts of things that Mr. Buer will get into would benefit the program. And we would appreciate a plan options, I would say, you know, like option A and option B for budget consideration so that uh, we can and weigh. I think, 
when I was nodding yes, I, I, I think Jeff and I have particularly talked about getting, getting more into a group of how many times do you give somebody a chance right. and making it more uniform and, and, and predictable in, in that regard as well. And, and like Heidi was saying here, um, planet lending, home lending, that was, I don't know, the fire happened within 24 hours. Judge Johnson gave us an emergency warrant of abatement, and that was with a representative attorney who really didn't want that property demolished. Um, but the reason he didn't, he said it was for insurance purposes. That, when that, when yeah. that happens, it knocks Jeff off his horse on what he's doing otherwise, and we're so minimally manned. This is this true. This is true. We, I think then it, we, the fire goes over that way. That's right. And yeah. so we need, for example, one thing I haven't seen here, maybe it's the next slide. Is, uh, oh, wait, there's more. 47th Avenue Southwest, right next to the park. Now, we, yeah, we're going to buy it. We'd rather have them fix it up, but it's a lot easier to buy it if you're cleaning it up and leaning on them. Uh, well, I, I don't know if I want to get into all of that. <laughs> I want to process. I want to do the process. I don't want to lean on anybody. I, 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 I'd more, like to go back to the kindergarten dance, example. They have a day, gator, um, greater density of of junk there, and who knows how many people are living there at the same time. It's just piling up. You, every time you go by, it's higher. Now there's no free space on the ground, and it's right next to a park we've tried to develop that it's is, and it's, gonna, and it's gonna start spilling over the fence any moment. So. <laughs> yeah, that one, it's, it's not necessarily like on my list. That was one that I think Parks was working to acquire, so there wasn't, it wasn't ever, Code enforcement didn't really follow up with that property, and I don't believe because Parks was trying to acquire that, so it's it's not on my list. It could be on my list, but it's not. So, Mr. Polky, uh, a couple of questions um, for Eileen. Okay. Or the first question for Eileen. Um, you mentioned it, the legal terminology, but we were told the legislature had made this change so mm -hmm. that when it's something was in the process of foreclosure, we would be able to do what we needed to do or the lender would be able to do what, and so we cheered that some few months ago. Right. In this case, it's it, now you're saying it doesn't really work. I wouldn't say it doesn't work. I'd say, well, you know what's interesting here is one, I'm not sure all the lenders understand the law. I'm not sure Dimitri really understood the law and what his authority was in order to maintain and preserve his property. Um, the second part is they kind of like it when the city does it for them. <laughs> As he said, he really didn't want to drive south and, and, and take care of this property. I mean, he, he just said it out loud. So, um, and you know, you can appreciate that when you can hire out maybe the city to do it for free, that's better, right? Um, the second point is just today, um, it's Lieutenant Unfred. I'm still new enough that I have to ask. Um, yeah, he, he contacted me because a lender had contacted him about a particular property. Then Bill Matthews went out to the property to inspect it. He said, actually, it doesn't rise to the level of a nuisance property. It's actually in pretty good shape. It's a brick a house with, and it's, it's well secured. So it's interesting that the mortgage lenders are now really jumping on top of this. So it may be just a function of a learning curve at this point. Um, they, they don't have the information. We are, are also learning. But we, we have to give that notice to the lenders saying, we've declared your property to be a nuisance property. We're doing that, I think. A, they have a statutory timeline to fix it as well. So right. So, so, yeah. so then, so then my next question on, on the 59, the now infamous 5912 property. <laughs> infamous, if, if yeah. I'm, if I'm a citizen, I'm looking at this picture and I'm saying, I see a dumpster. Mm -hmm. So if someone brought a dumpster on site, who was that that brought the dumpster on site and why isn't it being used? Dimitri. That was, the was dumpster was Dimitri? originally brought on by Dimitri Vizi when he had his contractor secure the property and, and eliminate some of the really bad stuff on it. The chimney was about ready to fall in. Um, there were some other issues on the back. The garage was had some issues from fire damage and electrical problems and all kinds of things. So he brought in that dumpster. Um, it went away one time with the garage and some of the other debris and then brought it back. 
I believe that company has since gone out of business. That dumpster is completely full of garbage, and it's actually going to be part of the dump that we haul off in the next load. So it's wow. it's unfortunate, but yeah, it was it was brought in by the bank, and then they left it at that point. Okay, uh, I mean, Mr. Whalen. Since this is our favorite slide, I think I sent it with a little caption. <laughs> I no doubt. Yeah. yeah. So, someone had mentioned to me, Jeff. I don't know if it was you or, or someone else that we do levy fines administratively in, on the owner slash lender, or is it on the owner until it's cleaned up? Well, you know, because the lender has an ownership is interest, right. we can levy those fines against them as well right. to encourage that person, especially if they have the ability like they do at this time. So, so I'd like to know how and how much we're finding these people. And this goes to the uh, no good deed goes unpunished bucket, which means no latitude. If we are properly following the process to find these idiots, I'd say find the hell out of them. And if it's a super priority lien on this property like it would be our expenses to tear it down had we gone through and when we go through the process to do that, we stick to our guns. Because that's the only way these people are gonna learn. So I want to know where we are in the, on the fining process with regard to these Lake Grove properties. And, ha, and just on, remind yeah. me of what priority the fine gets vis-a-vis -vis the cleanup costs when Jeff goes through the process finally to remove, scrape, and abate a house. Uh, I, I don't know the, the number of fines that were issued for this property. I know there was multiple fines issued, but it was they were issued when the previous owner owned the property. So. I don't we have a daily fine that we do if they don't clean up? We give them a citation, they don't do it? Yes. I hope it comes to a million bucks soon. You know, I, obviously that's facetious. But, I mean, I want it to be painful enough on this lender. Yeah, and it's, I mean, the, the citations is different than an abatement. I mean, oh, I, mean, I get that. That's why I want to know about how the citation fines are treated uh, in terms of the, the collectability, whether they get that super priority process or not, and, and how do we Those are handled, yeah, those are handled differently, because okay. that's, that's done under municipal court. Got those it. are municipal courts, and they, they chase down those funds. If they can't collect Got them, okay. then they send them to a collection okay. agency. So that's separate and apart from the abatement process, and the way we handle that in municipal court is when we get into court, and I think those are one time a month, the first Wednesday of every month, um, that's when we assess, uh, all right, how much have you done to actually improve the, the conditions on the property? Mm -hmm. If they've made some improvement, we can recommend to the judge, you know, you can reduce the fine, or um, if they've done nothing, then not only don't reduce it, increase the fine. Yeah. Um, it, it is our only stick. I mean, and that's what we're trying to strike the right balance between right. carrot and stick here. So, yeah. um, so the... So the fine against the owner, in, in most sure. cases, will be ineffective because it could be a lien behind the lender mm -hmm. who isn't going to get their money back. Yeah. Well, now, a fine against the lender, I'm a little more concerned about. You're concerned about walking onto the, uh, somebody's Fourth Amendment rights, walking onto the property and taking garbage away. Yeah. Uh, but the Fourth Amendment taking a property from a lender or attempting to find them by telling them to do something on property where they haven't gained control. Well, uh, and that's where this legislative fix changes everything because as of June, whatever it was, 8th or yeah, something, anyway, of, of this year, the lender now has an opportunity which by the way, it has, it, when you have rights, you have responsibilities, right? So they have the right to go onto the property to secure and preserve Good. the property. Because you have that right now, you also have that responsibility. Provided That's it's my in, argument. Provided and, it's in their lending documents. I'm sorry? Wouldn't it that be provided it's in their lending documents? I don't know about Which their lending usually, documents, but I'm, I'm, it creates, I'm saying, yeah, it creates statu a duty. There's a statute that creates a right that uh, is a right of but most of the, you know, usually the, the deed of trust would have yeah. if it's some kind of right of entry. Right, You're right. Yeah. They, they, yeah. they say you can do X, Y, and Z. The, 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 leg, the court case screwed that up and said, even though you contractually right. have that Nation right, you, Star don't, kinda turned that on its you don't head. have, yeah. you don't have that right. So, you know, I'd be concerned that we have a, some sort of process that 
with a bright line for the lenders that, you know, with. And we do. You, you I mean, we're, we're giving them notice and an opportunity to do the right thing. We're asking them to do the right thing. If they don't, then we issue fines and give them an incentive to I'm do asking, the right thing. How do thing. we determine that they can? I'm sorry? How do we determine that they have, they have the ability they have the legal right to do that. Because What's of that, right yeah, because of the legislative change to no. the Nation Star case. We just assume that they have yeah. good legislation. Well, I'm, I'm pretty clear they have the right yeah. and the responsibility. Under the Nation Star, they have to provide you with a copy of the, I believe, like when you go through foreclosure, you have to file a notice right. of foreclosure or whatever. Right. So they have to provide us with that. They have to provide us with proof that they actually have legal right to the building. So right. part of Nation Star addresses that. They have to provide that to us. So we would know that they own it. And, and, the, and the fix, the legislative fix also includes that. So we would get that in information. We would understand what their rights are and, and responsibilities are. Then we would issue the notice, or actually we issue the notice first. And then uh, at that point, they either pony up and do the right thing, or they get fined, or, and in this case, again, we're gonna move on there faster yeah. than, than we could get a, 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 any other kind of warrant. And, you know, the other, I think you've been working it out with the utilities, um, but that can be a time mm -hmm. delay as well. You know, on the emergency warrant, we got the emergency warrant, and then Puget Sound Energy kept us waiting for yeah, they wouldn't shut off the energy or the, the electrical um, supply. So you can't do a demolition without that being shut off. And that, that took two Is that weeks. a timing issue or is that just kind of their right hand not working with their left? I think Jeff's finally got to the, the correct people. Um, and, and again, I mean, we can make the utility companies look stupid so that they move a little faster. Well, I mean, um, it's, a, it's so. a good thing for us to know because, for yeah. example, the utility lobby guy reached our public affairs guy reached out to me to have coffee and this could be an issue i could say yeah. you know and by the way by the this way is something you can help us with <laughs> yeah, yeah everything. that one i mean that took about two and a half weeks to get them to disconnect the utilities wow. what, was, what was interesting is i called the utilities and, told, and i told them as well as did our contractor we have an emergency abatement we have an emergency warrant this okay. thing needs to come down so they said great you're on our emergency schedule i wait four days five days nothing so i called them and i said hey What's going on with our emergency schedule? I thought you guys were going to get that. And they said, yeah, you're on it. And I said, well, where are we? And he said, you got about another week and a half. I'm like, that's not an, that's not an emergency. Yeah. So I had to call the crew that actually does the scheduling and told them where that was. And, and he said, yeah, I drove by the site to look at it. Clearly, it's an emergency. I'll move it up. So I know the, the inside people now to kind of move our schedules up. But apparently, our companies think about two weeks is an emergency process. So that Maybe doesn't I'll work. Talk to them about Do we that. have a, any leverage under our franchise agreements? That's a great question. Yeah, we can certainly look at those and not only uh, look at the current language, but we can look at when they're coming up um, if that's there's a need for a different idea. language. Yeah. So and again, I appreciate this. And, and if you could, I don't want to add to your workflow, but I think it would be helpful for me, maybe the others, if we can just have a little pictogram about the process and maybe a site to <laughs> the code or whatever. And there's something because that way we're not yammering all the time. We can say, oh yeah, I understand. You re we recall. Here we are in this stage. Right. Okay. That would be helpful to me. You bet. Yes, sir. Yeah, just to follow up a little bit on the deputy mayor's inquiries. Over the past several years, and we have gotten a variety of uh, briefings on, on the processes and, and, and the things that go on. And it, it seemed that although in the code, the municipal code, we have the provisions of where, how the abatement, we have nuisances and that and things can be abated. And we have a process that moves through to <clears throat> It involves legal things and where if the city incurs expenses in abating a property, we can go through a lien process to get that back. And then we have the other thing that says that if you are the <coughs> perpetrator of, of a continuing nuisance, uh, that there are there is a, <coughs> a citation fine structure that is X amount of dollars a day to be able to do that. And that's what the, the code doesn't say either or, 
the code says you can do both. But my understanding in most of the time of the briefings that we've gotten from staff is as a matter of procedure, we usually make an either or type decision that you know we don't proceed with both concurrently. Um, if a person gives us some lip service that they're going to be cooperative with us, we stop issuing the citations because it requires someone to physically go there every day and be able to go and do that. And on the other side of that, in some of the briefings that we've gotten from the court and from the finance department, these particular fines, even when they're assessed, are the ones that typically either aren't paid, they either go to collections or at some point in time show up as being written off in something of where we're dealing with the, with, with the budget. And so when we, and, and I, ha I got the impression that part of the reason why we don't follow through aggressively with both concurrently uh, was a manpower issue because it takes someone to, to go and issue all these citations every day and we we do do them for a junk car parked in the right of way and things like that that, that will get things to where we can do that going on. So, uh, you know, I do think that in the, in the budget process coming up that looking to get some resources in place to be able to actively pursue both solutions and good intentions stated are are nice but results are better so do you have more to present i can go through it fairly quickly um, i will tell you i will tell you what was interesting though when um, um, jeff shared the shared drive abatements and it is in your shared drive if you ever want to see his wonderful matrix he's very organized his filing cabinet is is a thing of beauty and <laughs> um but looking at the years past and how many abatements what did you say it were about 15 20 to, 15 to 16 17 and it was an average it was an average every year it, this year we're up to 30 and well, we added we 10 will do, we will do 29 by yeah, i mean well and it's only august so we're up 10 with, I mean, with, and, and oddly enough, we have 10 judicial abatements. Right. So I think we're doing pretty well, which is not to say yeah. that they don't need more code enforcement right. um, help there, because I think then we could get more of them into the system. And we're getting more organized, more systematized in, in the legal department when they come through that we can more push a button than have to relearn it. Um, right. and Unfortunately, we don't have an inventory shortage. Okay. Yeah. Um, yeah. But, <laughs> well, there you go. But, but as you conclude this, going back to the mayor's point, and maybe Mr. Buer is sitting there, I mean, just think through as you end tonight and you guys go back and contemplate and you come up with a budget recommendation. If we were to throw, pick a number, 300, 400,000, I don't care what it takes to double it, whatever it takes to get it done. Think about what, I and mean, we're trying to help you, help all of us. Uh, what, what could that accomplish? You know, I'd like to know, you know, because because I think we're of a mind that we want to put some money at this and hit it hard and help you out. You know, the, okay. the three the, the three things I think I get the most feedback on are, it's, it's you really inconvenience me that you tore up the roads, but I really like that the roads are yeah. torn up because something's happening. Oh, gee, you've done wonders with Fort, Fort Stillicum Park. Yeah. Uh, look at how that's changed since the city. And piecemeal, you tore that crap down in my neighborhood, that's that's great. Now we've created some expectations, as some of us were talking about earlier uh, tonight, that people think that they can call the city and get some help, and we're, I think we're understaffed to help them at the level of service they expect. So, Mr. Bolke. And I'll, and I agree with what the mayor said, and so I'll just dovetail on that. I. 
first of all, the one in Stilicum has been, or Tilicum, excuse me, has been sitting there a long, long time. And I think the whole neighborhood, I know some people who live down on the lake and they were like, wow, the thing got knocked down. And they were just so pleased. And, and I, do, I do agree with the mayor. I think there's an expectation game and actually I think it's a positive thing. I think that some of the items that we're seeing, um, that we're getting on now on Nixon, um, that have just out of the blue kind of just arrived now, are an indication that you know people pay good money for their homes and, and they're like looking down the street saying, what's this person doing? So actually I look at it as a positive that we've actually get now, people are really getting to the act, really want ch some changes. And I think we need to embrace that. Um, so it's, it, it's, it's a resource issue. Um, clearly, you, you know, there's, and I guess I'm naive that I thought by now all the ones would, that were bad would be knocked down or darn close to it and we'd be down to just a few a year, but it actually seems to almost be speeding up, which is odd to me. Um, and, um, but it is what it is, and so we're, we're gonna have to deal with it. But, I, but I, actually, I, I, I actually think we should just embrace it and say people are complaining more because people are actually seeing these things. They're starting to look like eyesores. The city manager says the same thing about streets. He goes, well, the more streets we fix, the other ones look worse, right? They didn't, they're not any different than they were six months ago, but they're worse in retrospect. You know, they got that. So, you know, it's an expectations game. Yeah, I, I think you hit it on the head. I mean, it's what I have noticed from CSRT in the, in the years that I've worked with them. I mean, when we started the abatement, or when I started the abatement process, and we as a team were going, there was a number of projects that we were working, but there wasn't necessarily as much citizen input. Mm -hmm. So it was kind of code enforcement's out looking at properties, and we're generating the ones that need to get done. Um, at this point in time, it's probably 50-50, maybe even more with citizen input. So the code enforcement is actually seen, like you say, the expectation, hey, you know what, you dealt with my neighbor's house and it looked just like this, why aren't we dealing with this one? So we're getting a lot of that, um, and a lot of that is, is a positive thing, and I, I think, yeah, if, if we can continue to push that and keep that moving, then obviously it's gonna benefit everyone. Uh, I can go through these last ones yeah, really, sure. really quickly. <laughs> I took my blood pressure medication, so go ahead. You've, most of these are, unfortunately, they're all going to be on the same Lake Grove. <laughs> Lake Grove Street is the theme. Um, the good thing is, is the next five, six slides that I'll show you, um, we had an abatement hearing on today. The owners are dealing with all of these properties. So we're going to go from 14 projects done in about two and a half weeks to 20 projects done. Good. So the owner, this one is one that burned down. Um, 99th Street, which right. is uh, just south of Lake Grove, it abuts the property. Um, it had a failing garage, burned down, squatter activity. Um, another adjacent property, 602399th, same sort of a deal. Squatters in this property, it's got all kinds of building code issues. It's got a garage that's unsecured. Every time we go to this one, the squatters run out of the property and they go through the backside. We can never keep up with them, but there's always squatters. Uh, another one, 6019 99th Street Southwest, it, it as well has a garage that's unsecured. Uh, this one I'm sure you've seen it and it's unfortunately been uh, graffitied probably over the last six months more than I've ever seen. Uh, and the last one is a garage on 6102 Lake Grove. So all of these properties are contiguous. The owner has already worked on the asbestos. He's getting that finished. He's got some other things that he's doing and probably within about a week, week and a half, he'll probably be in for demo permits because he'll have all of his paperwork ready for us. So these ones are gonna move fairly quickly and I believe it's being developed into, I think 60 units of multifamily housing, three story, two buildings. So we saw his plans today and it was actually, it was actually kind of neat. He's doing studios, uh, sing, Studios, one bedroom, two bedroom, and three bedrooms. So three bedrooms is not something you see very often in multifamily, so it should be a nice project. Uh, another one that's a commercial property, this uh, is the one I'm working on now, is 112 25 mm -hmm. Pacific Highway. This is a two-story, uh, pretty much abandoned building. It's been used to store janitorial supplies. It's had multiple uses over the years, but really no permits to do any of the work they've done. So this has got all kinds of illegal additions. Uh, nuisance abatements, there's the one property that I'm working on, 411508, that's still got 20 so cars on it. Um, the owner has an attorney that we're working with and he's trying to convince him to get this project dealt with sooner than later. So 
they're making some progress, unfortunately, a little bit slow. Um, and then if he doesn't, we will move on that one probably within the next two weeks and, and clean that property up as well. Mr. Buer. Yeah. We're just displaying some anxiousness. Yeah, you like anxious. might have additional information for us. My anxiousness has to deal with both keeping the rental housing safety program going and doing abatement. You know, this is, you know, there's a small group of people who are performing these assignments. And, and my challenge right now is to make sure that both go well. That's the resource question we're asking right. you to help us with. Right. The other thing, too, is I just wanted to uh, say a few things about Ms. Walker's comments. She's right in the fact that we are all over the place doing too much and not being focused. We are trying to do a better job of focusing and have, having better coordination with legal so that we can move these along. And now uh, I'm managing myself personally the list. I'm asking Jeff on a regular basis where we're at and making sure that there is a proper coordination with the legal department. So I think there are efficiencies you're going to see there. I do also think that the expectation level has risen. Uh, incredibly so, which is a good thing because that means people within Lakewood are now talking about a quality neighborhood. And so I think your level of public participation will go up. But I am concerned about keeping all these balls in the air. And I can also say with some of the things we're seeing on the rental housing program right now, there are some bad apartment complexes that we're going to have to deal with here very soon. So I'll speak to the city manager more about that, but I, I under, understand what you're saying. Any other questions, comments? We do appreciate it. Well, we this this is the kind of reception you get for doing a good job. <laughs> <laughs> I'll work on that. <laughs> but uh, seriously, uh, I I think you uh, can understand uh, and appreciate the tenor of council's concerns. It's not that it's being done poorly. It's that we think you're under resourced, and we want to do more of this. And we know you can't. Uh, personally, I've been uh, I, I've been extremely uh, impressed with your work, Mr. Gum. I don't know how you keep this and all those goofy federal regulations straight in your mind, uh, but somehow you do. Uh, and if we could clone you, I would add that FTE tomorrow on an emergency ordinance. So, you need to uh, make an assistant city manager position for crap housing. <laughs> Cloning has a certain number. I bet you I can come up with it for you guys. <laughs> so, thank, thank you. you. Ms. Grouse. The other item I have is the condo liability reform resolution. We were informed by the Master Builders Association of Pierce County that King and Snohomish County Master Builders Branch produced a resolution they have been handing out to local municipalities to encourage local governments to show support for condo liability reform, mm -hmm. intending for state legislators to take action. So the MBA of Pierce is also doing something similar. So the question to the city council is, are you interested, and actually we're recommending that we support such a resolution since we're including this legislative change as part of our upcoming 2019-20 state legislative agenda as part of the policy manual. And I see heads are shaking yes. Yes. Okay. I, I Next think item is. At, the, at, at, a, at a minimum, consider it as soon as possible. Yes. Uh, so as soon as we respond back to them, it'll be, um, they'd like to get that going in the next couple of weeks. Mm -hmm. The Nisqually Tribe Council and the Lakewood City Council meeting. So we've received an email from Joe Cushman, the planning director for the Nisqually Tribe, regarding a meeting between the Nisqually Tribe and the Lakewood City Council for a meet and greet and update on current issues. He stated that the Nisqually has several new tribal members who would greatly benefit from such a meeting. He is tentatively suggesting an evening meeting hosted by the Nisqually sometime in September or October. And the tentative schedule is as follows, starting with introductions, and then an update on current activities and issues, identification of follow-up items of mutual interest, and closing remarks. So the city staff that are involved in this coordination and schedule are Assistant City Manager Dave Viewer and Brianna Schumacher, City Clerk. Some upcoming events we have scheduled and recently canceled due to the poor air quality, the summer concert series at Fort Stillicum Park featuring the good company Electric Swing. So our parks department is hoping to get that rescheduled after the uh, Labor Day 
Farmer's market, however, is still on for tomorrow. And then on the 22nd at 6 p.m., the Northwest Idea Tour House. This is an opportunity to see the newest and best ideas in building renovations. The shuttle location is at Tacoma Golf and Country Club, and you should have received an email appointment from Brianna for that. On August 23rd at 10 a.m., we have the 2-2 SBCT change of command ceremony at Lancer Field. And then on August 28th at 6 p.m., summer concert series at Fort Stillicum Park featuring the candy shop. So that concludes my update. So what change of command? The We don't have, it's a 23, I have at the 23rd change of responsibility. Correct. Is that right? Right. Okay. That's the Sergeant Major deal? Yeah, the Graves. Mm -hmm. And that's all I have. Yeah, thank you. Any questions for else? Mr. Brandstetter? Yes, uh, thank you. Um, if we could look at when a, a date for our uh, joint meeting with the uh, Nisqually Tribal Council uh, is, is finalized, and, uh, <clears throat> and particularly if they're going to host, um, if someone could research and there be some sort of information provided to us about protocol and customs and and, and things that, that that we sort of need to know as, as we as we go to their house so uh, that'll cost me a lunch but I'll do it the research and the customs well we at the county day job we have uh, a, a staff person that we hired as the tribal relations manager who is a Quinault and son used to work for the Nisqualis and she's uh, an attorney by trade but operating primarily on behalf of uh, planning public works and stormwater and about a quarter time with the executive's office and so I deal with her on a regular basis and she is the expert on such things, down to details on specific tribes. Mm -hmm. So um, I will buy her lunch and pick her brain. That's a good idea. Mm -hmm. And yes, Council Member Brandstetter, we do have some information on protocols, um, interactions with the Nisqually tribe that we can provide. But there are, there are subtleties. I'll give you one. One is speech patterns different. And while a pregnant pause in our culture may invite a response from the party you're dealing with, uh, in tribal cultures, at least in Western Washington, that doesn't mean that the person who's speaking is finished. Mm -hmm. And so you have to be real careful about stepping on people. That's something I, I've dealt with tribal members off and on for 30 plus years, and I never had any inkling of that until she told me. So, you, and so. Any other questions for Ms. Krause? City Council comments, Ms. Moss, no? Mr. Polky. Just a couple, just a couple of items. Um, first, and, and I won't steal Mr. Cal Deputy Mayor Whalen's thunder on the, the concert in the park uh, last Tuesday, but it was great and um, afterwards when we talked to the band members and whatnot, got some different ideas, but I think it's gonna be a, it's it's a very good venue because I actually I think it's very large just in the design. You're gonna be able to get a lot of people in there. Um, 
and the PCRC meeting, I went to that very short meeting. Um, the executive did speak um, on, on the subject that I talked about earlier. The other item was an action item. There was some contingency money in the last round of the, the traffic uh, or the construction dollars for transportation and 600 odd thousand of it went to University Place because they were next on the list. Um, actually, we were on the list, but we had already funded the um, the uh, Gravelly Lake Drive project. Although I don't know, it was SDT money, and that what we needed was something else. So, uh, but University Place was next on the list, and they gladly accepted it. Um, they do very well in these things, by the way. And that's about all I got. Transfer. Um, I would just want to report on the uh, Planning Commission. The Planning Commission um, both uh, had discussions amongst themselves, uh, held a public hearing, and uh, they have forwarded back to us a recommendation for uh, an ordinance uh, regarding uh, <clears throat> motor vehicle sales and rental properties which relates to the uh, emergency reg rules that we put in place. Uh, what they're coming back to us has some, they're recommending some slight modifications from the rules that we put in place, but are, um, uh, but are largely consistent with them. So I think we'll be seeing that uh, and be able to dis permanently dispense with that much sooner than the six month timeline for that, that the emergency regulations were intended to be in place. That's all I have, Mr. Mayor. Ms. Barth. Mr. Whalen. Uh, just two brief comments. I, I did very much appreciate the overview tonight on the abatement process and program. It's near and dear to all of our hearts. So look forward to more information and success stories on that. The concert in the park was great. I thought people enjoyed it very much. I thought the venue turned out to, to work quite well, obviously. The siding and the sound, we'll keep working on the sound piece. This Tuesday, of course, is another concert, so I would encourage those of you who haven't had a chance to go see it, it's, uh, it's yes. a great opportunity. Canceled? I just, no, I was looking to see what I was gonna say. I missed that, huh? So it's canceled tomorrow night. All right, doggone it. Oh, the air quality thing. Can you fix that? Can that be on the abatement schedule? All the Puget Sound air pollution yeah, control is exactly. you, you pay your money. Don't got it. I missed that. Sorry about that. Well, uh, with regard to that, then uh, back to the abatement thing, I am meeting with Matt Perry. He called me from PSC to just kind of have a touch base about issues. I'm not sure what is on his schedule, but if we could get um, Ms. Walker just a little brief overview on how the utilities might be of of help to us with regard to the emergency needs, just so I'm educated enough to ask him or present to him the question, that would be great. So I'm meeting on Thursday afternoon with him, yeah. And that's it, thank you very much. Uh, we had coffee with the mayor Tuesday. Uh, there was a presentation by the police chief. It was good. Um, the uh, tomorrow, no, Wednesday, excuse me, the 22nd, conflicting with something else I'm doing. Uh, from six to seven at the Tacoma Pierce County Health Department Auditorium at 36th and D, there will be a community meeting to learn about South Sound 911's new public safety communications building plans. Um, so I have a, other avenues to uh, be informed on that. But it, it changes weekly. If anybody's interested, there's your chance. Is there anything further to come before the council? I would plan on a lengthy executive session next week when Mr. Simpson returns. Oh, we're not doing it tonight then? Okay. Um, the personnel person was gone today and oh, she, okay. I missed the ball on getting the consolidation together on Friday. So I'll take I'll take the hit for that. Okay. 
I don't know on the study session. Hopefully longer. I'm trying to keep it light. So we can, yeah. Actually, we can, so Ms. Krause, if you can keep our study session light next week to the extent possible. Anything further come before the council? We're adjourned. Get the little communique through Brinout on the concert cancellation so people know. What was that? that? The concert cancellation is that getting out in the ether so people know not to show up? Yeah, Bryn should be sending it. I just took it off your calendars. Yeah, yeah. Okay.